The Vape Passion Show, episode 27. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is episode 27. I'm recording this on Sunday, July 31st. It's the afternoon. My wife is out with one of her friends, and I'm here at home while my daughter's napping. So we'll see if I can get through this show without her waking up, which is very unlikely. So I'm probably going to have to cut this short um, as soon as she wakes up, and then I'm going to probably have to record the rest tonight. But So that might be happening, but we'll see if we can get through this. So I donated blood yesterday, and then today I went to the flea market. I just got back. We were there for about three hours, and I also drank two beers. And... If you've ever donated blood, you know how exhausted you get just from doing that. And I, w- I was in the sun for three hours and drank two beers, both of which are um, you're not supposed to do after you donate blood. So I'm pretty exhausted right now, and um, but I'm committed to doing the show, and so damn it, I'm going to do it. But that's okay. I like doing the show. I have a lot of fun doing this. Um, so at the flea market today, I got a... In case you're wondering what I got, I picked up a bike trailer uh, just to attach to my bike so that my daughter can sit in the back there and I can start taking her on the trail. Um, I love riding my bike. I ride it to work a lot in the summer and it's just going to be a lot of fun to be out on the trails with her in this in the trailer. I also got her some little toy motorcycles and a, a pony on a stick so that she can pretend she's riding it, which is hilarious. You should see her riding it. It's so funny. And uh, I also got her a Winnie the Pooh music box. She loves music boxes, so it was really cool to find that. It's in great condition, and it only sent me back two bucks. So I love going to the flea market. I always end up getting a lot of really fun stuff, even if I don't really get anything for myself, which today I didn't. But I got to have fun hanging out with my brother at the flea market and drinking a couple beers. So that's that's fun enough for me. So as for vaping stuff, um, I got a couple of reviews. I sh- I've, I've got uh, quite a few reviews, actually, in the hopper ready to publish. Um, those will be coming out this week, probably. And I recorded three reviews yesterday. Um, two Enjoy Prefilled Tanks, which I'm a big fan of. Um, that's for the more... Those are tanks for people who like high nicotine and mouth to lung vaping but i like those so those two are vanilla bean and peach tea both of which i liked and i also did a review for i love cookies for mad hatter e-juice or mad hatter juice.com and that one's also really good it's really sweet and it does taste like cookies but i don't get all the flavors that they say is in there but it's still pretty good i think it tastes like a maybe like an oatmeal cookie or a coconut cookie not coconut flavor but it just reminds me a lot of a coconut cookie so you should see those pretty soon so other than that really not a whole lot new with me so let's just jump right into the news so let's talk about some advocacy um, regulation type stuff the first one here is an article on vaping360.com it's titled right to be smoke free coalition asks court to strike the deeming regulations so the e-vapor coalition which is representing the right to be smoke free coalition and the 10 other industry associations who are involved in this lawsuit are now asking the U.S. District Court to set aside the deeming rule or to declare it unconstitutional. Keller and Heckman, the law firm that's representing the e-vapor coalition, just released a press release which says that the FDA has until August 16th to respond to both motions. I'm going to talk about some of the things that I I think are worth highlighting here in this press release. So the first bullet point here says that the FDA has applied a statutory February 15th, 2007 grandfather date to e-vapor products, which was intended for traditional tobacco products like cigarettes not electronic cigarettes. So, the FDA was required under the statute to set a new grandfather date which would allow e-vapor products to take advantage of the more flexible SE pathway, SE being substantial equivalence. So they broke that requirement. Um, The second bullet point here, the FDA did not consider, as required under the Regulatory Flexibility Act, any significant alternatives that would have allowed vaping product manufacturers sufficient time to develop the extensive information, including long-term clinical studies necessary to successfully navigate the pre-market tobacco application process, the PMTAs. So as it stands, this data can't be generated in time of the deadline of that PMTA process of August 2018. Uh, The third bullet point here, even if the FDA is correct in that it must apply the February 15, 2007 grandfather date, to e-vapor products, that means that the Tobacco Control Act itself violates substantive due process and is unconstitutional. The e-vapor coalition has requested the court grant its summary judgment and 1. 
declare that the deeming rule exceeds FDA's statutory authority. Two, set aside the deeming rule to the extent that FDA has applied the February 15, 2007 grandfather date to e-vapor products and remand the rule to FDA so that the agency can set a new grandfather date. Three, remand the rule to FDA so that the agency can conduct a proper regulatory impact analysis that addresses the lack of long-term clinical data for e-vapor products. One more here. Four, declare the rule unconstitutional to the extent that it applies to the grandfather date to e-vapor products. So that sounds pretty good. And the FDA has until August 16th to respond to those motions. So hopefully we hear something pretty soon in regards to all of that. All right, let's talk about this next one here on vapingunderground.com. This is a thread I came across from the user 5150sick. This one is titled Vendors. Be careful, there are snitches amongst you. So he found something from countertobacco.org. It's a program called VStars. And what they're doing is they're hiring people to collect data by visiting vape shops. They're reviewing the shops figuring out I don't know exactly what they're doing there they're they're just looking at the shops and this data is supposed to inform policy but is not intended to assess compliance with regulations but it's a little bit questionable because people are thinking like what's to stop this VSTARS program from giving that information to the FDA uh, and actually having some kind of impact on regulations it uh, seems pretty shady but so let's look at what this VSTARS program is saying in their application. So it says, I'm just going to read this here, for someone who has already been hired and is going into the business, this is their script. So it says here to introduce yourself and talk with the clerk. When entering a store for an audit, we have found it helpful to introduce ourselves to the staff. If possible, try to not to ask the clerk questions if there are any other customers in the store in need of assistance. However, there are a few audit questions that may require assistance from the clerk. Often, you may find you are the only person in the shop. Many clerks are eager to share their enthusiasm for vaping with new customers. Be aware that some stores, particularly corporate chains, have policies that prohibit employees from participating in surveys. Others may ask you to contact the franchise warehouse or store owners before completing an audit. Also, please note that the FDA conducts inspections of tobacco retailers around the country, sometimes using covert officers. Likewise, some local agencies conduct inspections of tobacco retailers, often to assess issues like youth purchase. You may have to clarify that you are not an inspector by carrying some form of professional identification and using a script like the following. Hello, my name is blank. I am conducting a project looking at different vaping products that are sold in stores and how they are marketed to customers. I would like to look around for a few minutes if that's okay with you. I will not get in the way of any of your customers. I am not an inspector, nor do I have any connections to other stores or to the media. Thank you for your help and for letting me visit your store. So it sounds pretty shady. Um, they're telling people in the script to say that I am not an inspector, but in reality they kind of are. I, I, I guess they're, they can get away with it because officially they're not really an inspector. They're just a normal person being hired to do a sort of inspection. I don't know. It's a it's pretty shady anyway, but I've heard people saying things like like vendors asking customers if they're if they're an inspector or work for the FDA because the government employees have to tell you if they are or not. Like sort of like the thing where you have to ask a police officer if they're a police officer, an undercover cop. Well, that's a myth. Government employees don't have to tell you who they are and police officers, they don't have to tell you if they're a cop. You know, that's just one of the things with something like this. You just have to be on guard at all times. And really, if you own a vape shop, you should be doing anything to uh, high standards anyway. Don't be doing anything shady yourself and you're not going to get in trouble. Okay, and lastly for the regulation stuff, th I saw this note from vaping.org, the American Vaping Association. This one is thanking Sevia USA and Smoke. I just thought it was a really nice thing to mention because Sevia USA the organization being run by Dimitris, they just donated $10,000 to the AVA. And Sevia USA, they represent the non-profit partnership between the Chinese manufacturers uh, helping us out here in the United States with regulations. Um, that includes companies like Smoke, Aspire, Kangertech, Inakin, um, and, and some smaller ones, I believe. But in addition to that $10,000 donation, Smoke also contributed an additional $10,000, an individual donation. So the AVA just got $20,000 from just Sevia and Smoke. So it's, uh, I just thought it was something worth noting. All right, so now let's talk about some new products. The first one I want to talk about is the Iron Maiden RDTA from Hellvape. 
So a lot of reviewers are getting this right now. Um, I'm seeing it all over the place. And if you haven't seen it, you'll see that the, the label, the logo on the, on the tank itself says Iron Maiden and it's in the band's exact font, something that could cause a lawsuit for sure. This isn't an official Iron Maiden product. I don't know if Iron Maiden is going to actually sue them for it, but I don't see why they wouldn't. Interestingly though, if you look at some of the reviews, people are pretty positive about this, even despite it being uh, potentially some sort of trademark issue. But if you look at the review from Ownboy Josh, for example, he reviewed it and he said it's actually really good. One of the things he mentioned on his video here, well, he does talk about the trademark issues and understands all of that, but he does mention that it's a pretty beastly device with a lot of really unique features, including a ceramic chamber and deck, a unique spitback protection, top and side airflow, 22 millimeter build space, and an 8.5 milliliter juice capacity. He says it's got a lot going for it to say the least. So it sounds like it's a pretty good device, but you know, I don't know because of those trademark issues, you, you may or may not want to buy it. And then another product I want to talk about here is the a new product coming out from Sigeli. They're calling it the tea bag. Um, that's, it's really funny that these Chinese companies don't understand some of the things of American culture, or I don't know if, if tea bag is used in the same way in, as it is in America in other countries, but if you don't know what tea bagging is, it's basically the process of when someone's sleeping, dropping a, a guy, dropping his shorts and placing his nuts on someone's face. And uh, so they they missed that one. Pretty funny. I don't know if I want to uh, teabag myself with Sigeli's products, but pretty funny. Um, and then another one, I saw this one on tasterjuice.com. This is from P, uh, Phil Basardo. He sh posted a poster. It's just uh, an advertising poster from Kanger. And they're releasing the Aerotank Plus. The Aerotank was actually a pretty popular product a, a long time ago. And, uh, well, a long time ago in the vaping world, uh, the aero tank is a mouth to lung tank. So any of you mouth to lungers out there, this is going to be an exciting product for you. And for me too, I think I, I actually really like mouth to lung vaping. I mostly do straight to lung, but I do like mouth to lung too. So that sounds like a good product. Uh, he, he mentions here that he really doesn't know anything about it yet. He's, he just saw this poster, so we don't know actually if it's going to be any good or not but this is a two milliliter mouth to lung tank. They use 1.8 ohm coils. It's a 22 milliliter di uh, diameter tank, has replaceable Pyrex glass, and it has adjustable air flows. And it looks like it comes in black, silver, and white. So it sounds good so far. We'll just have to see how it performs. All right, now let's get into some health and research stuff. So this first one I wanna talk about is a, an article from Dr. Siegel on his blog, tobaccoanalysis.blogspot.com. This one is titled, Study demonstrates low health risks associated with secondhand vapor from e-cigarettes. So he points out here that there was a study published just recently in the journal Nicotine and Tobacco Research that demonstrates that secondhand vapor from e-cigarettes poses very little risk to bystanders. So I've there's been studies similar to this in the past that have shown the same thing. So um, it's good to see that there's a new one, but um, let's look at this a little bit. So they measured airborne markers of secondhand exposure, which include nicotine, aerosol particles, carbon monoxide, and volatile, volatile organic compounds in an exposure chamber. They generated e-cigarette vapor from three, three various brands of e-cigarettes using a smoking machine and controlled exposure conditions. And they also compared that secondhand exposure of e-cigarette vapor with tobacco smoke generated by five dual users. So the results of that study showed that e-cigarettes are a source of secondhand exposure to nicotine, but not to combustion toxicants. The amount of nicotine produced by the, the electronic cigarettes ranged from 0 0.82 to 6.23 micrograms, which is very little. The amount of nicotine resulting from smoking tobacco cigarettes was 10 times higher than from e-cigarettes. So, you know, I don't really think that nicotine is anything to worry about, but either way, tobacco cigarettes produce a lot more nicotine in the air. And what's worth noting about this, at least what Dr. Siegel points out here, is that Dr. Stan Glantz, who is well known to be anti-vaping, he talked about this study and twisted the facts, basically saying that e-cigarettes pollute the air and expose bystanders. According to Dr. Glantz, he says that e-cigarettes pollute the air with nicotine and fine particles, claiming that it's a health hazard. But Dr. Siegel here points out why the ar that argument is faulty. First thing he talks about here is nicotine exposure. So first he says, we have to quantify the exposure to nicotine for a bystander. So assuming the highest nicotine levels detected, which was 6.2 micrograms, per cubic meter, exposure over a full workday of eight hours, the nicotine exposure would be 4.8 times 
6.2 or about 30 micrograms per day, which is the equivalent of 0.03 cigarettes per day. So even if you were exposed for eight hours every day for a year, your total nicotine exposure would amount to the equivalent of only 11 cigarettes. So very low levels of nicotine there and uh, obviously nothing to worry about. So the next one here is fine particle exposure. So the average particulate exposure from vaping was more than five times lower than particulate exposure from secondhand smoke. But something even more important to note here is that exposure to the particulate matter from vaping is only transient. The particles dissipate within minutes, but in contrast, smoking lingers. So the exposure to, to that particulate matter is constant. So whatever kind of particle exposure there is happening there with vaping is much lower than with smoking and unlikely to pose any significant health risks. And then let's talk about another study that everyone's talking about recently. This one is a study published in Environmental Science and Technology Journal, and it was titled Emissions from Electronic Cigarettes, Key Parameters Affecting the Release of Harmful Chemicals. So the results of that study basically say that vaping products are producing bad chemicals, two chemicals to be exact, um, which they say may be carcinogenic or they can cause cancer. TheDripClub.com, they published a really good review of this paper and uh, called out a lot of interesting things from this paper that are clearly wrong. So let's look into the study a little bit first. So looking at the method of this research study, we see that they used a CE4 V2 tank using 2.4 ohm coils for almost all of the research. And they also used an aero tank, an original aero tank, using old silica wicked 2.0 ohm dual coils. So that's really interesting because they're using pretty much products that aren't used anymore. I think it was um, Dr. Farsalinos maybe made a statement on this one saying that they these products are so hard to find these days that these re researchers had to have actually gone out of their way to find these products specifically to get the results they want out of this study. But anyway, let's go into um, some of the tests here. Oh, they also used a vision spinner battery. So the experiment number one was overheating e-liquid. They incubated batches of e-liquid at 176 degrees Fahrenheit, 392 degrees Fahrenheit, and 536 degrees Fahrenheit for five minutes and then tested them for potentially harmful byproducts. And obviously they found some because they heated the e-juice to those temperatures. And what's weird about that is we don't actually raise the temperature of our e-juice when we're vaping it. Um, the coils raise temperatures, but under normal real-world conditions, thermal en energy is used to atomize the e-liquid, not to raise its temperature. So really strange that is they decided to do that with the e-juice. The second experiment was to measure the temperature of the e-cigarette aerosol. It looks like they didn't really find anything with that one. The inside of the mouthpiece of the CE4 reached 93 degrees Fahrenheit and 86 degrees Fahrenheit for the aero tank. It, that took 10 minutes of puffing every 30 seconds to reach. So uh, that, yeah, that took a long time to get to that point and that's not how a normal vapor vapes. But anyway, even still, it only be, got up to 10 degrees or so above room temperature. So uh, really nothing they got out of that one, I don't think. And then the third experiment was dry puffing a CE4. So they took puffs off the CE4 and the aero tank to measure the chemicals in the vapor. The dripclub.com believes that the CE4 remained in dry puff conditions for the entire experiment. And they believe this because their formaldehyde levels were w way above the levels that Dr. Con Constantinos Farsalinos found in his dry puff study, which was published over a year ago. Farsalinos took real world vapors and measured the aldehyde emis emissions from their devices to come up with this and to find out where they were getting dry hits at what point. So if you look at Farsalinos results with the results they get out of this stu new study, it's pretty clear that they were dry puffing that, that tank. And at every voltage they used, the CE4 was burning, which isn't surprising because the CE4s had a really big design flaw they wicked from the top rather than the bottom like all of the modern tanks we use today do. If you look at the results of the aero tank, it produced about 10 times lower concentrations of aldehydes than the CE4 tank. And despite that, for some reason, most of the research was carried out only with the CE4. They even seem to have made a slight attempt to hide the superior performance of the aero tank by using a logarithmic scale to display the results. This scale was showing how much emissions were produced of each of these toxins, like acrolein, acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, things like that. And uh, it's funny because if you look at these, at these graphs, the logarith logarithmic scales that they produced, it looks like there's not much of a difference here between the ego tank and the aero, aero tank. But uh, the, the author of this article at, on thedripclub.com he decided, decided to convert the results into a standard scale to show how big of a difference that actually is. 
and you can see that there is a massive difference between each of those tanks and just goes to show you how sneaky these researchers can be. So if we look at those cancer causing chemicals that they talk about, the first one here is propylene oxide. If you look at the worst offender in the study, the worst e-liquid that they tested, that came out to 6.7 milligrams per milliliter. So assuming that if you were using that worst offender, you'd still be in the NIOSH safe zone, which uh, NIOSH sets safe work workplace exposures. So even if you vaped 745 milliliters of that worst e-liquid per week, you'd still be in the safe zone uh, of NIOSH standards, workplace standards. And the next cancer causing chemical they pointed out was glycidol. This appears to be not something in the e-liquid itself, but something produced by generating heat. Between OSHA and NIOSH standards, the maximum allowable work, workplace exposure to glycidol is 264 to 528 milligrams per day. To reach that lower level of 264 milligrams, using the aero tank, you'd have to vape about 1.2 pounds of e-liquid per day. In the dry burning CE4, you would only have to take about 0.15 pounds, but that's still quite a bit. That's 68 or so milliliters of e-liquid per day in a CE4 tank, so it's just not gonna happen. So unless you're vaping a pound of e-liquid per day, and vaping nothing but dry hits, you have nothing to worry about. So clearly a very poorly pr done study. And I came across this funny picture here on Reddit that talks about this study and it says, two recent studies coming out of the US have claimed that e-cigarettes produce formaldehyde and other toxins. In both studies, the atomizer used was a CE4, an antiquated device. And this was ramped up to unrealistic power levels and used in a way that no user would use it. But why a CE4? They are almost impossible to find. Either these researchers searched out the device knowing its qualities, in which case the researchers are culpable, or they did not know what they were doing, in which case they were incompetent. Give them a job in a kitchen where they can only burn toast. And that goes exactly to the point I was making earlier. These guys had to have actually sought out a CE4 for the purpose of getting the results they wanted out of this study, because CE4s, they're, they're hard to find. Like, why would you even use a device like that? It's uh, silly. Okay. All right, now I want to talk about this scary article I came across on electronic cigarette uh, subreddit. Um, this has happened in Singapore. Scary for the residents of Singapore, anyone who vapes there. So um, this person mentions that it was written a few months ago, not long after his home was raided by the government for vaping. Um, because vaping is now illegal in Singapore, which happened uh, just recently, December 2015. He has been a vapor for just over three years and has been totally off of cigarettes for two years. So he's been vaping for a while, but even before vaping was illegal in Singapore. And when it became illegal, he, did, he didn't stop because he, obviously for health reasons, he wanted to continue vaping so he wouldn't go back to smoking. He was always a low profile vapor and only vaped at home and in his office, never vaped in public, obviously because it's illegal. And he never sold anything, never, not a single mod or a bottle of e-juice to anyone. But sometime this year, a package of his containing e-juices got seized at customs. He didn't think much about it until he got a knock on his door a few months later. They, the government, they, these guys came in, flipped his home, went through his phone, checked all of his messages on his phone looking for other vapors. They took all of his mods, all his juice, tanks, even his wires, and they took photos of his home, every cupboard and every shelf. After this, after they took all these photos, he had to sit down with them and they forced him to go through every single little item every bottle of e-juice, even some old lock rings for mech mods, every little piece they, he had to talk to them about. And he mentions that, you know, he's been vaping for three years, so he had hundreds and hundreds of little pieces he had to talk to them about. And he had to tell them when he bought it, how he bought it, what mode of payment he used, where the product came from, and how much it costed. If he bought it online, they wanted to know which website it was. If he bought it from a guest account, or if he had an account with the with the website. And if he had an account, they wanted to know his account name. So they wanted to know everything. And then he finally, when this was done, he had to make a statement acknowledging that he understood he broke the law. So he says here that he has absolutely no idea what's going to happen next. For the past few months, he's lived in fear. Uh, fear of facing what the government says that any person who contravenes the ban shall be liable to a fine not exceeding ten thousand dollars or imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months or both and in the case of a second offense a fine not exceeding twenty thousand dollars or imprisonment of a term not exceeding twelve months or both so in these last few months he's no longer vaping because he doesn't want to get caught again and have to pay a twenty thousand dollar fine or spend a year in jail he has gone back to cigarettes he says he was very determined to stay off of them but the first day was hail, so we tried nicotine patches, which didn't work. Moved on to nicotine gum, also didn't work, and then tried cold turkey. And he just couldn't take the withdrawal, so three weeks later he smoked his first cigarette in three years. And now he still smokes. He says he hated himself 
a lot for that, but now he has a little bit of relief from those cig cigarettes, so he's just going to have to keep doing that. And he mentions that hundreds of vapors in Singapore are getting raided. The UK Health Ministry tried asking the Singapore government to allow vaping as a smoking cessation aid, but the government just won't allow it. They continue to justify the ban, saying that vaporizers may contain cancer-causing agents and could be a possible gateway for children and teenagers to start smoking. That's really sad for people who live in Singapore. And how ridiculous is it that the Singapore government is saying that vaporizers may contain cancer-causing agents when we know that cigarettes contain cancer-causing agents, yet Singapore residents are allowed to smoke? It's uh, silly and such backwards thinking. I really feel sorry for people out there in Singapore who want to quit smoking using vaping products. Okay, now I want to talk about mouth-to-lung vaping. So, I know that uh, there are still a lot of people who really like mouth-to-lung vaping. I'm one of them. I actually prefer straight-to-lung most of the time, but uh, when I'm at work, I like to mouth-to-lung vape, and sometimes when I'm at home even, I think uh, mouth-to-lung vaping can be relaxing. But a lot of people think that there aren't any MTL devices out there, and that's true. There, there aren't a lot. It's, it's definitely not as popular as everything else. It's, it's definitely not as popular as straight-to-lung devices or, or tanks. But there are actually quite a few options out there. They can be kind of hard to find and might be even a little bit expensive. But uh, I was doing some research because this is something I've been interested in. So I did some research recently, and uh, I've put together a, a pretty big list of things that I found people recommending on various forums and other places. So I'm going to run through those. So there's Triton Mini, Tobacco K-Fun V5, Clone. Uh, I saw people mentioning this one, if you can't afford the K-Fun 5, which is, uh, I guess, with a, a kit, the, the mouth-to-lung kit. The K-Fun V5 is actually a really good mouth-to-lung device. If you can't afford that K-Fun V5, which is pretty expensive, $125, I believe, something like that, The people are saying that the Tobacco Clone is actually pretty good, um, which can be had for much cheaper, something like $15, I think. Um, so moving on, the, the new Adamin V3, the Cloud One. If you're interested in uh, Genesis atomizers, you can go with the next gen, which is people are saying is very good. Inax MK3, the Yellow Kiss Pico, the Izzy, the new Telemahos tanks, the Kabuki with a P3 connection, the Hurricane tank. But I'm, I saw a comment here from someone saying don't get the Junior because it's not mouth to lung. The Origin Tiny, the Origin 1922, the Origin Genesis 4 mil or 6 milliliter are both mouth-to-lung friendly. The Earl, the Calyx, the SXK Corolla, the Russian 91%, the Typhon GS, the Ego One Mega VT Atomizer, the Flash E-Vape V3. I saw a lot of recommendations for K-Funs, all of them. Um, most people seem to recommend the K-Fun 3 or the K-Fun 5. I've heard people say the K-Fun 4 can be good, but there's so many parts that it's really hard to use. So if you're not interested in doing a lot of work to put together your your K-Fun 4, go with the other ones. The Orchid by Aethertech, the Spheroid version 4, the Heron version 2, the Squape Reloaded or the Squape RS. I've heard that the Squape X, some people like it, some people say that there's too much airflow. Um, many people recommend the Squape V1, so that's something to look into. And the MarkBugs.com Gem or the Gem 2, both of those I've seen recommended quite a bit but they're hard to find and can be expensive. And then some more well-known tanks I saw recommended were the Joytech Cubis and the Cubis Pro, and I, I uh, also saw the Kinger Pro Tank 3. So if you're looking for mouth-to-lung vaping, there is actually a lot of options. Uh, nowhere near as much as there are straight-to-lung vaping, but you've got some good tanks here. And after doing that research, I'm actually really excited to pick some of these up. Um, I don't have a lot of money to buy these authentic versions, some of them because, and even some of them you can't even find anymore, but um, I'll probably be picking out, picking up a few of these on Fast Tech, so I'm really excited to try a lot of them out. Oh, another one I want to add, the Nautilus X, uh, the Nautilus Mini X or Nautilus X, I can't remember it now, but um, I, th I saw that Grim Green said that it was terrible, but everyone else is saying it's really good, so it's still something that I want to try out. Oh, and then that one that I mentioned earlier from uh, Phil Basardo, the Aerotank Plus. Oh, okay, yeah. and then I saw this thread on vapingunderground.com. It's titled, Who Makes the Best Yogurt Flavored Juice? Um, there wasn't a lot of comments here, uh, which is too bad because I love yogurt flavors, 
and there's just not a lot that I've seen. Um, I mean, you can do a search on Google and find a lot of flavors, but there's no telling how good they are. So I'd, I, I'd love recommendations also on that. If any of you guys out there have a recommendations on a yogurt flavored e-juice, e but some of the recommendations mentioned here include Kilo's Key Berry Yogurt and Lost Fog's Streak. This person says both are fantastic. Uh, this person says, check out Mohawk Vapor. They just came out with a cornflake drizzled with milk and butterscotch. Not necessarily yogurt flavored, but a, a sort of breakfast themed. Another one he mentions here is Rock and Raspberry and Punkberry Yogurt, also from Mohawk Vapor. He says Mohawk Vapors do premium juice without the price tag. Another person here says, not exactly a true yogurt, more of a fruit and nuts flavor, but he really likes a new new by 63 Maui. And uh, this final one recommendation here is for Charlie Noble, they make a decent yogurt juice. I haven't tried any of those, but I do have a recommendation of my own, which I actually think is could be hard to find. I don't know if this company is even still making it. So this one is Bohemian Grove. This was from Pluminati. I don't remember the, th that was like a smaller brand. Oh, 5280 Vapor. So this juice is made in Denver, here where I live, and it's really good. I liked it a lot. I tried it at a convention two years ago, I think, and I always uh, was hoping I'd find it in a shop someday so I could buy it. And then I finally did, um, I don't know, six months ago, and I had to pick it up. And uh, it's not as good as I remembered it being at the convention, but it's still really good. It's a very good yogurt flavor. Um, it's a bit mild, but I love it. And it's almost gone, and uh, which is sucks because I don't know if I'll be able to find another bottle. Um, it was a little bit expensive, but I thought it was worth it. But yeah, if you guys have any recommendations, oh, I've heard uh, Addy's yogurt is a very good one. People seem to love that one. I haven't tried it. I, I do have the recipe saved on eliquidrecipes.com, so I will will eventually get around to making it myself. And then this last final one I wanted to talk about is, it's just something funny. I thought um, it was a thread on vapingunderground.com titled, Let's Make a Disgusting Recipe. So the original rules that he set forth for this, this project was that he wanted everyone in this forum, anyone who commented, to get together and make a recipe. Um, whatever recommendations they want, whatever flavors they wanted. He says that the juice will either be 15% flavor or 20 flavors max. Um, so he set that limit. Everyone who posts has to pick a brand and a flavor and a percentage between 0.5 and 2%. If there are any flavors that he doesn't have, he'll buy them. But he said that he wants people to pick flavors that can be used more than once because he's not going to spend $4 on a bottle of INW cat farts, you know, something that can only be used once. The thread has run for a while, at least a week, and he decided to put together the list of things he's going to buy. He's going to order and mix this by the 25th of August. He'll, he will make a video and post notes. And if any of these concentrates that have been chosen aren't available, he's going to sub them for the closest thing. So this list, I'll go through here, is Capella's New York Cheesecake, Capella's Butter, TFA's Honey, TFA's Western, and I looked that one up. People say that this one is added to the mix to give a, a cigarette taste. It supposedly works pretty well for that purpose. Um, TFA's M-Type, which is also another tobacco flavor. INW's Whiskey, INW's Shisha Strawberry, INW's Shisha Vanilla, Flavor Arts Blackfire, and that one isn't a tobacco flavor, but adds a smokiness flavor. Uh, a lot of people use it for their tobaccos. Uh, I believe this is Flavor Arts Lang Lang. He didn't add who, what company it comes from, but it is Lang Lang, and that is a flower. People say that this one is described as slightly sweet, a little soapy, extremely floral, and like perfume or incense. So that one, I have a feeling that one is going to be very overpowering in this e-juice, but uh, we'll see. And then black licorice. He's also going to add a few drops of malted milk and a few drops of joy. And uh, joy is another popular one. Um, that one, people say it tastes like funnel cake, cotton candy, and vanilla. So a lot of very, very different flavors there. And I'm excited to see what this one, what he says this one tastes like. Yeah, wouldn't it be crazy if that if it turned out to be like one of the most amazing e-juices ever? So we'll have to stay tuned. I'm going to follow that thread so that I can make sure I get updates on that one. All right, so that's all I have. And I actually made it through this whole show without my daughter waking up. So uh, that's great. I'm really excited for that. Um, now I can spend tonight editing it. So uh, anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. You'll find the show notes for this one on vapepassion.com. Just look for episode 27. Uh, if you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page. You can find that at patreon.com slash vapepassion. And uh, I'm only asking people to donate a dollar. 
per month. Um, not a whole lot, but you know, it would, as it adds up, it would certainly help me keep going. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at vape passion. I'm on Facebook also at vape passion. And if you listen to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google play, you can find me on YouTube. If you want to be notified of new episodes, giveaways, I don't know how long giveaways will last with these FDA regulations, but, um, for now, any new giveaways or any of my recent reviews, you can subscribe to my newsletter. You will find also find that on my website, uh, vapepassion.com. And like always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me, alex at vapepassion.com, or just go to my website and uh, submit the contact form, or go to my one of my YouTube videos. Just leave me a comment. Um, doesn't matter what video, I'll, I'll respond to it. And so that's it. So I hope to see you all again next week.